and that's a uh, uh, a platform that uh, hosts interactive webinars and uh, hosts interactive courses and um, uh, can take you to virtual field trips. Um, welcome, Tip. Uh, let's start with introducing ourselves. I'll uh, I'll let you start, Tip. Sure. So I'm Tip Meckel. I'm a senior research scientist uh, at the Gulf Coast Carbon Center in Austin, Texas, where I've been for the past 15 years uh, working as a geologist and geophysicist on CCS topics. And I've worked extensively with some industry sponsors, as well as with our U.S. Department of Energy to do demonstration projects in CCS. And the last 10 years or so, I've been focused a lot on our uh, Gulf of Mexico for storage. So I've seen just about every aspect of CCS over those 15 years, uh, everything from characterization and monitoring to uh, even some of the capture and transport side stuff. Uh, in this course, we'll be focusing mostly on the, the storage part, but uh, but we will have content that, that contributes everything uh, about CCS in the subsurface. So looking forward to interacting with you. Yeah, I introduce myself, uh, Urian Reis. I, uh, I work about 24 years in, uh, in the industry. I'm a geologist by background, structural geologist. Um, and for most of the, my career, I worked at uh, Shell in various roles. Uh, I've been a venture manager, principal regional geologist, uh, regional exploration advisor. And uh, about a year ago, I decided to start my own company and agility to work on, uh, on CCS and geothermal and uh, do training and advice. Um, so that's me in a nutshell. Uh, I look forward to collaborate with you. Uh, let's start uh, with a brief outline on what we are uh, going to show you today in the webinar. So uh, first introduction, I, uh, we are in the middle of that. Then I will take you to uh, a short field trip to the book cliffs in Utah uh, on uh, the Stratbox platform, so you can see a little bit how we can interact there. Uh, then another short field trip to some core in the North Sea. Uh, an uh, actual gas tool that's poised to be used uh, as a storage uh, facility. Um, we look a little bit at the case study of uh, Slide for, uh, for CO2 project, and then we will end with some, uh, some highlights of the course we have in September, uh, the Geoscience of Carbon Capture and Storage course, uh, some highlights about the box, and we'll have uh, some time for Q&A at the end. Um, if, you if there are questions, please, Put them in the in the comments and we'll come back to them at, uh, at the q a so i'll show you a little bit where we're going to take you to so uh, the first stop will be the book cliffs um, in, uh, in utah an outcrop at gentile washington helper it's a cretaceous prograding short fake sequence um, then uh, we move to the north sea it's a, it's a core of the triassic uh, bunta sandstone uh, and that's a candidate for the porters project uh, CO2 project. And uh, the last point we stop at is uh, the, the Sleipner uh, CO2 uh, injection project and the UTSI reformation there. So let me move to uh, another screen and go to Stratbox. I think that worked. So here we see uh, 3D scan of an outcrop in, in Utah. And uh, let's start here with the front. We can zoom in here and we see you have a pretty massive sandstone. And if we zoom out, the outcrop is actually part of something bigger. And uh, you can see that here. We can look at the image viewer. So that bottom part is not in the 3D view, but we mainly look at this uh, highest and system tract. Okay. And you see the massive sandstone here, and, and we can investigate a little bit what else we can uh, see there. So some questions we could um, ask ourselves, um, this outcrop we use as an analog for, for reservoir. Uh, is this a good reservoir for CO2 storage? And what kind of problems we might have here? Uh, I want to stress that uh, we, we're not looking at seal here. That's another, in the course, we'll cover that extensively but, uh, in this webinar. Uh, we have to be a bit selective, so this will be about the uh, reservoir only. So let me close this. Who do you think uh, is this a good reservoir? So yeah, you, Juria, you might point out, um, you know, the differences that you're seeing there in the, in the stratigraphy, so we can kind of think about which which parts to consider. Uh, we see at the bottom there's a thinly layered uh, sequence there. Uh, kind of intercalated sands and, and muds there 
fairly thin sands, uh, transitioning up with a fairly sharp base there at the bottom of the massive sand there. And then as you go back into the top, you get into uh, some more thinly layered, but but certainly more, more sand rich uh, uh, settings. So I guess the first question would be, you know, it might be obvious, but where is the best reservoir here, right? We, we, we would like to identify that first um, and, and think about the thickness and the characteristics of it. So, um, so, so where, where are we really looking for, for the best reservoir here for storage? Now we have this 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 massive uh, thick sand here, and even though it's massive and thick in this this big part here, did you see my mouse? I'm not sure if that yeah, I think that comes across. Uh, you do see there's some some thin layering there. So um, one question I would have is 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 that uh, is that all connected, or could there be baffles in there? And another question I would have is how does this develop laterally? Is if we drill a well here, you may think like oh, this is a nice blocky sand, but um, how does it connect? So let's let's zoom out a little bit and and turn the, to the corner. And so you see the the rest of the sequence. And um, oh, sorry. So you might give them a sense of scale of of the thickness of that that most massive sand there in the face of the cliff. That's on order of uh, if you've got sort of the the small trees there for scale. Um, we're oh, talking. Okay. I think we can uh, just measure it up. No. Yeah, so you measure it up and... It's so about 35, 36 meters of massive sand, and then the whole sequence, if you measure it up, is uh, about 100 meters or so. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I display this picture because there's, there's some interpretation done before by others, uh, and it shows that it's a pro some progressional stacking, offshore, offshore transition, um, uh, foreshore, shore phase, um, and you see these diff different sequences. Uh, and what we can do, uh, sorry, I need to switch that off. Um, what we can do is, uh, I did that before, uh, look at the interpretation and transpose it onto, um, uh, onto our outcrop. Uh, so let me load that scene. So here you see these different sequences transposed on the outcrop. So in in pink, I have outlined so what what is sort of covered, and then uh, yeah. the sequence boundaries in, in yellow, and then uh, shales pointed out in green, and then here in sort of the bluish purple, we put in some fractures. So I guess one question I would have to tip: um, What do you think about the various elements here? We could we got these shales that are in here and thicker to the to the left and we got these fractures what um what are conduits what are baffles what how would you look at that yeah so i mean one of the things that i think is nice about using an outcrop example to discuss this is that on the face of the outcrop you it was very faint but you could almost detect a a, a layer in there that you've highlighted in yellow uh there and it's it's rather hard to see on that side of, of the exposure but as you go back around uh, into the into the third dimension, you begin to see it's it's much more pronounced, and and actually probably uh, somewhat of a of, of a distinct sand. Um, the transition of that um, is is probably very sharp, and and the grain sizes probably don't contrast very much. So, if you were to drill into the cliff face over on the right, you would see that as mostly one, uh, to, you know, thir thir uh, uh, one sand body. But as you travel off to the to the to the left side in this view, you'll see that that actually becomes two thinner sand bodies that are uh, that are more distinct. Um, and so uh, it's important to think about whether or not you would you would really try and be developing the entire sand thickness um, where you might perforate in this sand. Um, obviously, you'd want some more information about the porosity and permeability structure in here. And we'll we'll kind of cover that in a different part of this presentation today in terms of how to evaluate uh, some core. But here you're seeing distinct uh, differences in the in the stacking of the of the reservoir and the thickness of the reservoir as you move laterally. So important to consider a depositional system, yeah. So now you're seeing some sense of of how this might work in a depositional system, whereby you're you're in the in the more aggregation or the, the the thicker amalgamated section on the left, and and moving out into the more uh, progr uh, more the uh, the distal part of the system as you move to the left on this image in the, in the prograding aspect. So um, 
you'll see uh, uh, if you were able to look at the overall uh, thicker sequence beyond the single outcrop, uh, which might represent just one of those numbers in the overlying image, um, you would see that this this is a, a, an, indeed a part of a progradational package. So we're not seeing everything in that image uh, here necessarily, um, uh, but you do catch uh, part of it. So um, so now you now you get a sense that okay the the, the reservoir continuity uh, might decrease as you move more distally uh, and thin as you move more, move more distally, and this would in in the end impact uh, the ability to to uh, hold CO2 were it to be injected. Um, an interesting question might be well where would be the best injector location in this particular uh, outcrop section. Um, so what thoughts do you have on that, Yuri? No, and, and here, of course, he, the most connected part is probably um, the place I would go for. Um, and, and the one question I would have is, um, uh, yeah, here we clearly see in, in, the, in the left-hand side that we have intervening shales, but this thinner part here, there, there may be some thin shale veneers that still will hold up with CO2 going up. Um, so that will be an important thing to think about. And um, uh, we, we can show a model let me, let me switch that on. That may be a good time now. Um, uh, so this is a model of the Ulti Reformation in um, in Norway. It's a quite simplistic model pre-drill in Norway. And they also they dealt with quite a massive land, but some thin intervening shale layers. Uh, it's, a, it's a quite good quality, dusty, blocky sand. And there they expected that these shale layers will hold up the CO2 and then rig through at various places and so this is an image i want to you to keep in mind because later on when we talk about slapner uh, it'll come back but another yeah, question I have is, uh, sorry i was just going to say one interesting thing about that in particular and, and thinking about that injection slide is i think our intuition initially on these kinds of injections would be oh well we would probably perforate that entire uh cliff face right like that would be uh that would be a, a production mindset um, in an injection mindset, you might alter that a bit where you might not be actually perforating that entire section because of the different uh, permeability structure. And so in the end, you may choose to perforate just the lower part of that section, anticipating the, the movement of the CO2 and the, and the vertical rising of it. So I think we need to highlight that some of our petroleum systems and petroleum production uh, uh, concepts translate quite well into CCS. And some of them need some modification to, to account for what's new and different about, about CO2. So in the course that we're going to be offering over the three half days, we're going to try and focus on those things that are, that are really unique to the CCS aspect. Aspect. Um, but we'll also be uh, pulling forward a lot of our experience from our, our petroleum settings. And so one of the things you might ask at this outcrop is, you know, what might be different if it was a, a depleted gas field that you were developing here, as opposed to, say, just a primary saline reservoir? And my first reaction might be, well, at least if you had a productive gas field in the past, you might know quite a bit about the flow history of this outcrop. And you might know how compartmentalized it is vertically uh, with those with those yellow lines that Yurian has, has added here. Um, and, and you might know if one of these flow units is indeed uh, better, so to speak, than, than, than the other, even within that massive sand. Um, so, so I think in a, in a depleted gas sense, you would have some prior information that might help you understand the flow characteristics. If you were going into this as a purely as a, as a saline formation, you wouldn't have that kind of information. And so you might need to get some additional uh, information on this. And then the other thing you added, Jury, in, in here is you've got some vertical uh, fracture systems in there. And so those are the kinds of things that, that don't show up very well in core, because you could imagine drilling a core here and, and missing one of those features entirely. Um, but they might exist at that kind of a spacing. Uh, uh, and they generally tend to be on the order of about the thickness of the, of the formation that you're looking at. And here you can see that's uh, not quite true, but but almost true. Um, they're they're spaced quite widely, uh, and if you get into the smaller uh, sands, they'll be they'll be more closely spaced. And that's something that you could see in an outcrop that you wouldn't necessarily appreciate in your core. And they might allow for some vertical translation between uh, these different flow units. So something that that we appreciate in an outcrop that we don't necessarily appreciate in a well log or a core. Yeah, and it's important here to note, you, you see that these are fractures, they, not, they don't offset the, the, the shales. And there's also not much discoloration or gouge there, so here we would think they're more likely conduits and they may connect 
Yeah, can you zoom in just maybe on one of those features so we can just get a little bit of a better sense? Yeah, in here you can get quite close and 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 you can see that as as Urian was pointing out, there's really no offset in these in these fractures. So you might begin to think that they're essentially sort of opening mode fractures, and so you might consider that they have some sort of of uh, unique permeability structure that's that's different from the horizontal sense. Um, uh, if you were able to, to actually look at these in detail and see that they might have some unique cementation history, they would actually serve as fairly strong vertical barriers, or at least um, you know they would they would hinder migration laterally. Um, so one important question for this outcrop would be: Do you believe these features would actually inhibit your ability to inject CO2, or or will they in fact uh, be more or less uh, imperceptible to the injection? And it has largely to do with 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 what the what the actual characteristic of the of the the fracture zone itself is here. Yeah, I think on that note, we talk a little bit about core. How you didn't see this? Maybe it's a good point to have a look at some core uh, tip. Yeah, so, it's about. Let's move to a, maybe a core example where maybe you've drilled through this formation, and now you don't get a nice outcrop exposure, but you've essentially got uh, some core that you're going to bring back and do some evaluation of. So it's going to look quite different, of course. Um, it's going to be, uh, you know, uh, we at the bureau have a lot of core that we end up looking at in detail, uh, and and we often have the well log to go with it, as you see here. So why don't you introduce this one? Uh, this set. yeah, so this is a it's quite a different piece of rock. This is a uh, Triassic formation uh, in the in the North Sea, the Dutch sector of the North Sea, and this is actually from a field P18 that at the moment is considered for CO2 storage. Um, so. Therefore, a, a good example. So it's, it's a bit of a different rock. This is continental uh, sandstones, uh, mainly Aeolius from Fluvial. Um, you see here that is uh, the gas field that is now nearly depleted. So this is the, the depleted gas field example that the tip talked about before. And if we now look at this top section, it's interesting to see, okay, what's the permeability like? How does that develop? So we, uh, we plotted the permeability of all these plugs, uh, core plugs. Um, you know, in, in, in this slide. So you see at the bottom that uh, the permeability is really quite poor. Uh, so th this is the one millidarcy line here. Um, but here at the top, um, you see uh, uh, Darcy sands, really, really quite nice. Um, so let's have a look at that uh, on the core itself. Uh, move in and zoom in a bit. Yeah, it's quite interesting because if you look at the core just a, as a first pass, you might assume all of that permeability is rather similar. And I've seen this in, in quite a number of cores where, where you actually, even though it looks uh, fairly similar from a grain size uh, uh, and, and sort of sedimentary characteristics, when you actually get the, the, the measurements, it's, it can be quite different. So, no, in the, Indeed. And in the, the, there is, if you look in detail, there is some uh, small telltale sign. So here, for instance, on the side, you see that um, uh, the raisin is sort of uh, uh, imbibing into the into the rock. That's a good sign of permeability. So if you look here, you can see uh, gas permeability, not too good yet, 200 millidarcies. Uh, and here you see more imb imb imbibing, and there it's almost four darcies. Uh, and the other thing you see, that, like here, there is a bit of a black shale colored layer. So if we click on that, you see it's only two, two millidarcies. So there is a considerable difference from four darcy to two millidarcy, and this is only in a few meters. Uh, yeah. So even if you don't see proper intervening shales uh, in the core like this, you, you could still have significant baffles that uh, uh, will, uh, will have an impact on CO2 flowing in. And, and I should, we should point out that, you know, in the in the course, the, the, the three half day course, you know, th we'll be spending much more time with each of these kinds of content. And part of that will be to to break out into groups and make some observations and then come back and discuss what we find. So there were, there were a lot of interactivity here, opportunities for the participants to, to add some of their interpretation, as you see that Urian has added here. That's one of the real advantages of teaching this course in, in, a, in Stratbox is, is having that ability to, to have the, the participants actually uh, doing hands-on involvement, making observations, maybe spending some time with this, and then and then the group coming back together to discuss very much like you would do in a, in an in a, in an actual uh, 
core facility or, or at an outcrop. We should have mentioned in the prior outcrop, we could do that sort of a, a scenario uh, as well. Of, uh, of, of Stratbox that uh, uh, people can, students can collaborate, make observations, come back to the plenary, explain what they see and, and discuss together. So it's really quite interactive. Uh, that interactive part is a bit hard to do in the webinar, but uh, you get a bit yeah. of it. But and yeah, the emphasis would be on on having the, the the participants try and actually apply their understanding, and then and then we can we can also uh, serve as as some guidance and expert. Uh, on, on some of the topics and some of the specifics that that might not be apparent in a in a cursory uh, workshop uh, uh, workshopping of it, uh, so hopefully your understanding of these things would it would progress uh, from from applying your own knowledge and and in a team setting, and then us being able to provide a little bit of extra uh, understanding of that uh, in the context of CCS. Yeah, so students will get actually a temporary license of Stratbox, and they can they can actually make observations and make these drawings I do, can make themselves, save that, and we can then, as a group, look at different interpretation of different people and and uh, and, and discuss that. Um, so I loaded some prior here because we don't have time to all interpret in here, but uh, you, you get a bit of an idea what you can do. And if you go down here, you see indeed that uh, that imbibition is, uh, is gone and we got into really low permeabilities. And this core we loaded in such a way that we can interactively check the measurement so you see here uh, we have five darcy's and this is uh, five milli darcy's here so it's it's quite um quite local reality and that's exactly what we saw in the measurements in the beginning uh but uh, you can also see it in the core so uh, i'm afraid as already we need to move on to the next topic it, uh, it's, it's it's a rather rural event but um if you want to see more come to our course uh, so uh, I need to keep talking. Uh... Well, yeah, so 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 we're just trying to provide some examples of the types of things that we would be doing in longer time segments within the within the full course uh, to give you a flavor of how, how this might work. There would be some component of of sort of what I would refer to as more traditional instruction where we'd be doing some content transfer on some fundamentals getting into the, the real details uh, you heard some terms there imbibition and and things like that 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 we would take the time to explain uh in more detail in in the, in the full course setting but here we're trying to just give you some feeling for for how we might uh present this content and interact with our participants. The, the ultimate goal of the course is to have a, a, a number of participants that allows for a lot more interaction that's not really possible here in the in the large format setting, uh, just in this webinar uh, that we're doing today. Yeah, thanks. In the meantime, I managed to switch over to PowerPoint. Uh, so let's have a look at our next stop, uh, the Slipnus CO2 storage case uh, in, uh, in Norway. And it's really quite interesting because they started quite early with injecting CO2 into uh, uh, at Salem Aquifer. Uh, they did that uh, in 96. So uh, it's already more than 25 years going. Uh, I don't know exactly how the tonnage today, but it's more than 90 million tons they, uh, that they injected in there through a single well. Uh, and the other thing that's interesting is that they, uh, they put a lot of monitoring equipment there and they share a lot of data so everybody can learn from that. So uh, and the Salem first Utsira formation is a myopliocene prograding sequence. It's highly permeable, Darcy sand, so uh, not unlike the top part of our core, and not unlike what we saw in the, the massive sand, the, the proximal sequence in the book list. Um, extremely large, relatively shallow water depth, uh, shallow um, depth, uh, about 800 meters, uh, low temperature, 40 degrees, and it's hydrostatic at that depth is about 80 bars. So that means that the CO2 is in the gas phase on only just it's sort of hovering around the critical point uh, and that's important because if you look at different cases they're all over the place and some are really in the supercritical fluid phase and that, that has implication on how you inject and which logical observations are met do matter um, so let's have a closer look so here you see um, uh, the two-way time map of the Utsira formation in uh, in Sleipner and uh, it's a uh, it's quite a thick sand, about 200 meters thick, so it's a bit thicker than the book lifts. Uh, more than one Darcy, you see it's nice and blocky, uh, but also some thin intervening shales. Uh, not that thick, but they do have an impact. Uh, there's uh, a few there. So I, uh, I asked you in the book lifts to remember this the simple diagram they, uh, of the model. They, uh, 
at pre-drill and Sleipner, the intervening shales and uh, uh, the injection well that um, put gaseous CO2 into this uh, reservoir and how it then percolates through the system. And on the right hand side, you see the actual reservoir model. There's two kinds of models. One is uh, assuming localized leakage. So those might be the fractures we, we, uh, we saw in the booklets. And the other is a more uh, distributed percolation. Uh, in the end, it doesn't matter all that much, but th that's the difference in the model. Uh, but what's nice in Sleipner is that they put all this monitoring equipment in. Uh, and uh, so not just well head pressure and flow rate and gas composition samples, but they put seven time -like lapse uh, for the seismic surveys in there. So that's 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 quite impressive. And um, two repeat gravimetric survey, surveys, sorry, some typos there, and electromagnetic survey and seabed surveys. But particularly the What's nice here, because it's gaseous CO2 in a uh, saline aquifer, you can actually see the CO2 injecting and in for time lapse, you can actually monitor how it migrates to the system, which is quite nice. And it, it, there's many cases where you can't, if you go into the feed the gas field and you inject CO2, there's no seismic contrast, so you, you're not gonna see that. So those are things to think about. So let's have a look at what that, uh, what that looks like. So this is, uh, the difference between the first and the last survey, uh, 94 and 2010, and you see here it's quite quite thin on the on the slide, but it uh, this is the injection well here, uh, it goes on each injection point is sort of down there, and you see how it migrates to the different layers, and some layers it has actually advanced quite far laterally, and other layers less so, and that depends on the geology of the layer and and how they connect. Um, and if you look here at the, the, the top layer, I have to mention here that that rat is uh, is uh, soft. Yeah, so the rat is where the, the, the CO2 uh, migrates system migrates in the system. So this layer nine, if we look at that through time, uh, you see that here. It's, it's quite a nice picture in in 1994. It didn't move that far, and then you see it progressing and uh, laterally moving. And at some point, actually. Here it spills into a neighboring high and then it it continues there further in that high. It's a really a quite a nice image and we're lucky with Sleipner that one it has the right condition and two there the investment enough of seven surveys that you can actually track this. This is a um, quite a nice example. So now let's have a look again at uh, some of these 4D examples. So uh, the 94 example, the 2001, 2008, and 2008 to 94 difference. And compare that with our model, uh, the simplistic model we looked at at the outcrop, and the, we looked at it at the, the reservoir model. You, you do see indeed that uh, the CO2 comes up, then moves laterally along a high perm layer, and at some point it finds another leak point, or the, the pressure is enough to uh, to overcome a capillary anti pressure, and it moves to the next layer up. And you see indeed that these layers, lateral extent, is quite different from layer to layer. So that that's that's not too unlike. Uh, a simplistic model and it's kind of nice here that you can look at the geology and predict how that's going and then have the 4d seismic to uh, confirm obviously that simplistic I, view detail is more complex <laughs> yeah i think what's really uh interesting about this example it's not only is it's the longest lived injection that we've that, that that's been able to be monitored so extensively um but there was this uh there was a sense that here we learned that that the buoyancy of co2 um, was really quite an important part of the flow uh, aspects of the CO2. And so um, uh, I think everybody would admit that at the beginning, there, it was a bit of a surprise as to how much vertical uh, uh, layering there had become in these different layers. And it was attributed mostly to the, to the buoyant part of, of the CO2. So, so we'll spend some time in the, in the course thinking about the, the different aspects of flow and viscous flow versus capillary dominated flow, which is, and the buoyancy aspects, which are really highlighted here. And the other thing that this project really uh, exemplifies is that in these relatively shallow and very, very permeable uh, settings, the CO2 is, is, is quite readily imageable. Uh, and this has, has turned out to, to, to lead to a, a sense that this is probably uh, an expectation in a lot of places. 
And we'll share some information in the course about how that, that may or may not be true in other settings based on the different types of geology and or depths and, and whatnot. But, but this serves as a, as a really one of the most well-studied settings that serves as a great uh, sort of touchstone and example to, to depart from as you move to other types of settings, like the fluvial settings that you might see at Schnovit versus uh, some of these other types of settings that we'll go through uh, for all of these examples that, that Urien will mention here shortly. And I think the other important aspect we don't see so much in the seismic here is that um, this, uh, over time, this gaseous CO2 dissolves in, um, in the brine that is already there. And actually, because it then becomes higher density, it will start to drop down. So you. Yeah. You, and what I found most interesting about the scientific dialogue about this particular site was came back around to the mass accountability because it's, of course, very well known how much was injected at this site in terms of the mass that was injected. But as it, you go into an, an imaging technique like this, there was a, a real struggle to account for the full amount of mass that had been injected. So there were many, many studies done to try and understand that aspect. And I think when you consider how CCS will be monitored uh, for regulatory compliance, this example serves as a really nice uh, conversation piece for understanding what you can and cannot achieve in your monitoring strategies for, for CCS. Yeah, it's quite important. Um, so, a couple of lessons learned in Sleipner. Um, already discussed it. the value of geophysical imaging and uh, monitoring data is, is really important. You can not always use seismic as a monitoring tool, but monitoring is really important. And there's a lot of practical learning about the capacity and injectivity, and also the, the fluid dynamic process between CO2 and brine, which we just touched upon how that dissolves, how it moves up buoyantly. Um, and also how the detailed geological features control the distribution. And um, are in, a, in a simplistic sense, it's, it's predictable and detailed sometimes that can be quite complex to, uh, to predict. Um, and one thing they realized, this, this started so early, it wasn't the time that downhole gauges were not um, that common. So new CO2 projects will suddenly use downhole gauges to get more control over pressure and temperature. Um, <clears throat> so, um, this is already the end of our field trip to Sleipner. So I would like to take you briefly to, uh, to our course and give some highlights on uh, what we're going to cover in the full course. It's a, it's a three day course, three half days, uh, days of four hours and a virtual instructor led course where we'll use both slides, but also um, uh, exercises and, um, and strat box. So, after that, you, you'll get in a position that you can firmly articulate the case for CCS and why it's important. Also, understand the CCS value drivers, uh, and that, that, that's sometimes quite different from the oil industry. Uh, a lot of industry people know how to see a valuable gas opportunity from a less valuable gas opportunity. But, but in the storage resources, it's um, a lot of similar, but sometimes things are quite different. So. We, we take you to that uh, thinking and um, what geological data and observations define the value. So we we teach you how to effectively explore for these CCS opportunities and also how to evaluate an opportunity and quantify the value of the storage resources. And uh, importantly, we'll do that also with, with real examples and uh, take us to the lessons learned of these real examples and understand the pitfalls, things that uh, we have now learned through these, these projects, but we might not have thought about at the beginning. And Slipen is one case, but, but there are many more. Um, so a number of topics we'll, uh, we'll intend to cover there. Uh, the reservoir geologic characterization, you, you got a little bit of a flavor of that in this, uh, this webinar. But also uh, another important aspect, which you didn't touch upon here much, is uh, containment, seals, how the seals work, some capillarity the theory, um, how does the CO2 interact with uh, brine in certain rocks and how is it different from hydrocarbons and when is it similar? Um, we talk about the exploration of um, uh, carbon storage sites, evaluation, the effects of faulting, um, uh, how CO2 trapping mechanisms work and in, in, in confined versus unconfined CO2 storage site, well, how does that matter? And what are the value drivers? Um, a, uh, we talk also about uh, the, the, how do you define uh, storage resources and there's, there's well-established uh, ways to do that in oil industry and there's, there's also now emerging uh, ways to do that in uh, with, 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 with CO2. Um, 
so Yurian, what, 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 you know, we're going to focus a lot on the geology in this course, but I think one of the things is that, you know, it's really accessible for anyone who's coming in with some sort of experience in geoscience that's maybe down at the bottom of the learning curve, and then we'll move them up. But I would say we'd also have some content in here for, for folks who are pretty familiar with, with reservoir geology that want to take their understanding of how to apply that to CCS up that curve as well. So I think we could, our goal would be to move everybody much further up the curve on CCS aspects of, of, of reservoir geology uh, yeah. than where they might be today. And, and that could, you know, we could also imagine that benefiting some petroleum engineers who, who maybe understand a lot of their prior engineering uh, characteristics, but maybe need to understand a little bit more of the geology for CCS. So uh, yeah, this is uh, a lot of different co topics being covered, but we'll try and, 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 and hit them at the levels of the participants so that we can make sure to bring everybody up the, up the learning curve. Yeah, and also because it's quite interactive, we uh, we use the experience of the participants, uh, so that it, it, it can be quite a diverse group. But people that have uh, experiences either directly from CCS or from petroleum industry, and then we can help. We can think about how does that translate to uh, to a CCS problem. Uh, uh, so we build on the knowledge that uh, that each of you have, and then uh, leverage that to get to the observations to make for um, for common storage. Exactly. Uh, we, we, we we're requiring that the participants come with some some under, you know some interest in applying what they already know and and evolving it into the CCS space. Yeah, we already gave a flavor of that in this webinar. But uh, I think what's quite unique in this course that we have this uh, interactive strat box to do virtual field trips and exercises, and uh, that as a group you can actually go to the outcrop, answer some questions that we pose, come back to the plenary, and we discuss the observations. There may be different interpretations and different observations, and we, we can take that together and distill the insights that are important for CO2 storage. Uh, and I think that makes this course quite unique with respect to other CCS courses. Um, and then uh, the other aspect is that um, the lessons learned, you really want to go to the real projects. And there's been quite a few. Slipner is a long-lived one, but there, there are quite a few around the world, and they're quite different. So you see here in the, the, the phase diagram um, of, um, of CO2, so Slipner sits around the critical point, but these, there's many different projects, and some sit in the gaseous phase, but in, uh, in much higher pressure. Uh, others sit in supercritical phase, and that all they all post their own unique set of problems and different geological observations start to matter. Uh, so we t we'll take you through that. Uh, you had the flavor of that with Sleipner, but there, there are other projects with, uh, with, with different lessons. And I think it's important to know these lessons that we, we don't have to uh, fall in pitfalls that have been fallen in before. Um, so I want to end with, uh, with, with this slide uh, on the course. Uh, if, you, if you're interested, please sign up. I, uh, I have a link on the, the top there. Uh, uh, the, the closing date is the 16th of September, so it's uh, at the at the first come first uh, serve basis. Uh, virtual instructor led course, so we will lead you through it. Uh, yes, we can, you can do it remotely, but it is as you sit together in the classroom, three half day sessions. Um, we have timed it such that uh, people from Houston can participate, but also in the London times under the Hague time zone. Uh, uh, a little bit on the early side for some, a little bit on the later side for the others, but it means we can get quite a, a diverse group together. Um, the next course is the 27th to the 29th of September. Uh, I already mentioned that the, the closing date for registration is the 16th, um, and uh, it's $1,500. I'll, I'll leave this slide up for you to remember that uh, you, can, uh, you can sign up uh, when you're interested. Um, but before we move to questions, I would like to briefly hand over to uh, Claudia, who has a, uh, want to say a few things about uh, Stratbox. Um, Claudia, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Claudia Ruiz Graham. I am the founder of uh, Image Reality. Uh, this is a company I started five years ago. Uh, we created Stratbox, a platform for uh, immersive learning, remote collaboration, and collaborative data integration in 3D space. Now, give me just a second. I'm going to share my screen. OK. Now, let me know when you can see it. Uh, and let me just place my uh, presentation. 
Great. Um, so, um, as I was saying, Stratbox is a platform for collaborative data integration in 3D space. It uh, is hosted uh, in AWS. This is in our in our cloud infrastructure. It's hosted in AWS. We provide secure on-demand data access and distribution. The platform is available in virtual reality and in desktop. Desktop is what you have seen today and what you will be using during the course. And we also uh, collaborate with partners who provide data, uh, group data libraries and courses uh, through, um, and like to use the platform for courses to, uh, uh, to, to the customers. Uh, in, in the platform uh, in VR, um, you experience outcrops at real scale or 3D models at real scale, you can interpret directly. Uh, and the great thing about this, you can integrate data all the way from basic scale, very large scale to power scale uh, in the same space, collaborating remotely with others in 3D. Um, uh, I would like to mention one of the models used uh, by Julian today is from RPS, is from uh, one of our partners. Uh, they have provided a collection of about 90 outcrop models. Uh, around the world with analogs all the way from continental plastics to deep water uh, reservoirs um, and variety of tectonic and sedimentary environments. And uh, we are also bringing a collection from RS and our partner. It's a collection of our models uh, from uh, the Colombian basins and reservoirs in Colombia. Uh, I would like to mention uh, we are bringing a very soon a Stratbox Core Explorer. Stratbox uh, Core Explorer is a web application that will enable to run virtual uh, core workshops. Uh, it will enable easy access to your core data from anywhere. Uh, will you be able to integrate and compare different nets and have uh, in, uh, uploaded automatically Think sections, uh, annotations, etc., all to the same spot. Um, with that, uh, just would like to remind everybody: uh, hope you enjoyed the session today, and that you join us for the geoscience, carbon capture, and storage uh, virtual course. Uh, I think now is a good time to open for questions. I think there are some questions on the uh, on the uh, on the, set, on the panel of questions. That's right. Thank you, Claudia. I have the questions here, so I can read them out. And I hope you can hear me well. So one of the questions we had here was um, relating to some of the content that you spoke about before. What are the geomechanical challenges for injection in such a compartmentalized reservoir? Yeah, I, I, I would say that, you know, we, we tend to focus a lot in CCS on, on the CO2. Um, where does the CO2 go? How, you know, what is the capacity? But, but really pressure is actually a much more significant part of these injections and what happens to the pressure is uh, is highly significant, especially for these geomechanical aspects. So I think you could assume that when we were first talking about that outcrop in Utah uh, and we were wondering about those vertical fractures and whether they might impede or, or, or flow or not based on their, their diagenetic history, um, you might you might also realize that oh this could actually cause some some pressure issues as well, and so we'll be able to talk a lot more about pressure in the course. We have entire sections on it, and and how that might relate to the geomechanical effects. But we we do have some experience about how how deformation does occur in these reservoirs when you when you induce such large pressure perturbations, and we'll be able to convey some of that, uh, especially with relation to to projects like Insula or some of the others where we have direct observations about that kind of behavior. But but the the question is is, is well targeted. You know we we do need to understand the pressure perturbation and how it evolves through the reservoir in, in maybe a, a little bit uh, more than, than we might anticipate from a depressurization scenario in a production setting. So mm -hmm. I couldn't give you an exact answer on that particular outcrop, but you're absolutely right. The geomechanical effects of the pressure uh, that's induced is, is quite a significant part of these uh, operations and one we'll cover in detail in the course. Absolutely. And Insal that's a nice example of that. There's quite a bit of a few observations there. Perfect, thank you. On to another question then. Do the supercritical conditions guarantee the safe stability of the plume, despite there not perhaps being a, a closure trap, like an anticline, for instance? 
again, I think the uh, you know the what's interesting about the the CO two part is that we we tend to we'll talk a little bit about how we intend to to retain the CO two in the subsurface because of course it's buoyant like an, an oil or a gas, and it wants to move uh, in vertically in the reservoirs. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the different trapping mechanisms that are involved. And in, in you're you're referring to sort of the closure scenario where it's more typical for like a hydrocarbon setting. But we also anticipate quite a bit of local capillary trapping in a reservoir, and that, that would be something we could discuss a lot more in an outcrop setting like we were presenting here, where we might wonder exactly where we might see some of that local capillary trapping. And, and this ultimately relates to the capacity of the system for, for retaining CO2. So uh, we, we'd like to believe that that after the pressure perturbation has, has basically started to subside uh, post-injection, that most of the CO2 will essentially become immobile, except in maybe that high saturation area that would reflect the, 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 the structural closure itself. Yeah. And, and in the gaseous phase, actually, it absorbs a bit better and sinks down than it is in a supercritical phase. So uh, it's, it's actually a complex question, but it has <laughs> quite a few angles. Um, but uh, uh, it is indeed critical to uh, to guarantee the stability of the plume and, and think about what kind of trap does that and what kind of phase uh, behavior is, is best to do that in. Uh, yeah, and this is, this is another place where we can bring a lot of our 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 his you know our experience to to, to the discussion. Um, for example, there's a, there's some natural accumulations of CO two in the western U.S. That that have had quite a bit of study in terms of of understanding their 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 performance and and one of the things that's quite interesting about those is you do see some dissolution in those settings, but it's it's actually the, the fact that they're still there millions of years later is telling you something about that dynamic of, of the ability to to dissolve the CO two into the into the brine phase and and so we can talk a lot more about those those specific examples as a way of understanding how systems might behave overall in an injection scenario. Perfect, thank you. And then another one here. Um, what happens in the situation with a potential cap rock with a great organic material content? I guess that's yeah, that's an interesting uh, question. And I, I, uh, the interaction between brine and, and, and methane can be quite different than with uh, supercritical CO2 and with, particularly with organic material because it's, uh, it's often CO2 wet. So you capillary uh, effects to um, hold the seal may not work. You may just get Darcy flow. The problem is that you, you can study it on a micro scale, but on a, on a microscopic scale with very thick um, cap rock, uh, where the mineralogy varies, it's difficult to actually exactly understand um, uh, what happens and how the, the organic material is uh, distributed. But that's definitely a worry, organic material. In principle, if you have uh, with, with the wrong minerals, you, you could have the situation that you hold methane and you don't hold CO2. But it's uh, it's not studied as good as it is with, uh, as well as it is with, um, uh, with hydrocarbons. Uh, and it's there's a big difference between what happens on a microscopic scale and what happens in a in a big seal over several square kilometers and hundreds meter thickness. So uh, it's a subject of ongoing debate. Yeah, there there was an interesting example in the North Sea at the Miller Field where it was a it was a very CO two rich accumulation and and the, there was some documentation of how much the CO two had invaded into the overlying seal. And, uh, and and what kinds of geochemical effects uh, took place there, and and so that's again another sort of anecdotal example that we can we can bring into the discussion to understand some of these these issues a bit more. But yes, CO two interaction with organics is is definitely a, an interesting topic. It can also lead to the liberation of methane, which uh, which then presents e even more complicated flow flow characteristics. So uh, an interesting topic for sure, and and one that that we don't always think about uh, initially when thinking about mostly these clastic reservoirs. Yeah, there's nice examples in, in, in Brazil, actually, where the, the CO2 has liberated uh, methane from the source rock, and you get a very complex mixture of, uh, of oil, methane, uh, methane dissolved in CO2, CO2 dissolved in methane, and uh, if you look at the pressure depth curves, it, 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 um, it's quite different. But there's, there's a lot of examples there that uh, we, we can draw upon and to explain what actually happens. Thank you. And then another one here. 
Could you share some insight on the best practices for CO2 injection in very depleted fields, 50 to 30, uh, sorry, 30 to 50 bars, from the PVT perspective, e.g. the Joel Thompson calling in relation to reservoir quality? Yeah, that's the, it's also a very good question. So, uh, and, and, and a very uh, uh, pertinent one right now. So, uh, some of these North Sea examples that have uh, very good reservoir, like we just saw in P18, which is sometimes up to 10 Darcy's, and very low pressure. Uh, if you if you bring CO2 along a pipeline at supercritical conditions, you get a huge pressure drop, and the Joule Thompson effect, the cooling can lead to significant problems like uh, freezing your annular fluids in the well, you can damage your well, uh, hydrate formation and uh, thermal uh, fracturing. Uh, and, and those are things that, uh, that, that the teams that are developing that are currently considering and they're, they're really careful about how to handle that pressure. And therefore it's also important with these projects, if, if, you, if you design it well and you can have a very constant flow, you don't have to switch on and off, it's much better than if you made a mistake and you have to shut in the well and then restart it because all these differences in pressure, you have to think about this two constant cooling. I, I think this question also brings up a, another really interesting point, um, and that is wh why is it so heavily depleted in pressure? Is that because it's compartmentalized and therefore when you go back into reinjection, you're gonna you're gonna experience a similar compartmentalization that limits your ultimate capacity. For example, in our in our Gulf Coast settings in the United States, we, we find that 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 pressure depletion is quite rare because there's usually very strong aqua, aquifer support for a lot of the fields. And so we often think that that's actually a very good thing because it means that we can then again push the water out and have, have, have very far field boundary conditions. Whereas a setting like you're describing where you've gotten into such extreme depletion may also be telling you what the ultimate upside of your, of your storage might be in addition to all of these aspects that you're in was just describing. Uh, that's true. And if it, many do not see fields are boxed in between folds. And as often you saw that in the P18 core, a low perm layer underneath so you don't have a lot of room to move and you have you you, you have to deal with the box you have and that that creates its own problem so this it's a very good question yeah great and i'm just going maybe we've just got perhaps time for this one um can we apply the same technology in cbm block s if yes then how to select the site <laughs> i think this refers to cold bed methane if i'm if i'm inferring that correctly um, and we have seen that uh, uh, we have seen that studied uh, quite a bit in CCS, where you might actually be using CO2 to inject into CBM blocks to to release some additional methane, and we know it can actually occur. Um, one of the biggest challenges has to do with the permeability structure of of say cleated uh, coal coal formations, where you're you've got a lot of really complicated flow, and so understanding how much capacity you're going to get in storage versus how much liberation of methane you're going to get from the from the, coal, uh, the coals itself is 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 uh, something that is highly variable. I will say. Um, so it also brings up the question that I've heard a lot, which is, you know, can you use uh, CO2 in in, 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 in in stimulation, in fact, fracturing, uh, uh, et cetera? And so this is a, a, a separate topic. But yeah, you can you can use CO2. CO2 typically will displace the methane, and 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 you can produce some methane out of this. I don't know what additional perspectives you might have, Yuri. Yeah, not the CBM per se, but uh, the CO2 to displace the methane uh, is uh, in the K12 field in um, in the Netherlands. Uh, they have used CO2 injection to, uh, to up the pressure and uh, and recover some additional gas. It's a slightly different. yeah, we we could bring I I could point you to a lot of information in the in the Appalachians in the U.S. where where this topic has been addressed quite thoroughly and and it would give you a lot of insight into how you might select those sites for optimization of that. I assume you're sort of referring to re-injecting into those same wells um, that you would have been producing from. Um, there's also the ideas that you can do these sort of, you know, more sort of like huff and puff EOR type scenarios. Our, our course itself won't focus a lot on, on enhanced recovery uh, characteristics. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit more on on how geology impacts uh, the storage of CO2, but these ideas all become intertwined at some level. Perfect, thank you. Perhaps actually we would have time for one last one then. Could you kindly tell us a little bit about how we can evaluate areas with a poor data set and even worse, only 2D and one or two well data positioned far away, about 60 kilometers <laughs> or more from the interesting area to be developed as a CCS? Now, this is a classic exploration question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, 
but you know less, you will have to invest more in, in, in the exploration phase. So you may have to drill some wells up, up front and maybe shoot some more seismic to get the concrete and do that. So it depends a bit on the situation, what's, what's the regional geology, uh, 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 how big are the uncertainties and which uncertainties do you really have to narrow down before you can develop this? Yeah. Uh, that, that depends on the, on the unique situation of the, of the area you're evaluating. But yeah, the, the, the classic techniques of um, hydrocarbon exploration often help here too. You can do CRS mapping. Uh, Dip wrote a nice paper about that. Um, and But only the parameters are a little bit different. So you think about, okay, how expensive would it be to inject here versus a, another place? And you, you look at reservoir, how worried you need about, about containment, um, how much monitoring do I need to install to mitigate some of these, uh, these issues? So uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, one question like that I can't answer in a, in a short sentence, but it, um, there is a lot of exploration techniques that, that can address reducing the uncertainty up front to, to help there. But that's the advantage of injecting in a depleted field that you know a yeah. lot, but has a lot of other disadvantages. And that discussion on the pros and cons of both, I think, will come back a few times in the course. Yeah, and Camilo, I would I would love to to tell you about some of the uh, some of the what I would call sort of the the mid and far field wildcatting for CCS in our basal Cambrian formation in the mid continent in the U.S. and like the Illinois Basin, and 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 where that has actually uh, run into trouble, like you're describing, where you, you're assuming that that formation is going to have pretty similar characteristics, but because it hasn't been explored extensively in the past, what they ended up finding out is there was a little sub basin on the on the on the margin of the main basin, and that it had very different geology, and so in fact that that sort of mid to far field wildcat was in fact a bust. Um, for exactly the re reasons you're describing. And so I think you can't not underestimate how important the regional geology is in understanding how, how your local geology is going to be affected. And so, yeah, we, we would really like to focus on some of these geologic concepts uh, in, in this course. I would, like very, I would like to add with my explorer hat, very important to have data integration in 3D space, uh, particularly in the exploration phase. No, it was a great question, actually. Uh, that's often a, a problem in a CCS uh, also. Uh, I, I think we are at time, more or less, and uh, I realize there's many more questions which we would all love to answer. So uh, what do I, I encourage you to do, if there's questions that uh, you have that are unanswered, uh, please put them in the, in the LinkedIn event uh, comments, and uh, Tip and I will make sure that uh, uh, we will answer uh, uh, in the chat. Uh, so we can continue this conversation. But it's really great to see uh, this, uh, this big attendance and, uh, and the very good, interesting questions. I enjoyed this, uh, this webinar. Thank you very much, Julian and Tip. I would like to add maybe one uh, more last comment, uh, and it's to remind everybody that whoever attends the course, they will be getting a copy of Stratbox. When you are in the, in the platform in the Stratbox, you see the models and the outcrop models and the core data at high resolution. When I was looking at the LinkedIn screen, because of the streaming, sometimes it might not appear to be the case. Uh, but if you are in the platform, you will see you will see no delays, and you will see it on on, on very high resolution. That's all. Thank you very much, Tip and Julian, and to the all the attendees. Yeah, and, and feel free to reach out to any of us if you have uh, additional questions about the course, uh, either via LinkedIn or or other uh, emails. Uh, so. Uh, Look forward to interacting with more of you uh, in the course in late September. Yeah, please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.